Lesson 2 for October 5 to 11, Nehemiah, read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, October 12. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to open some fascinating books again this week, and as we do so, we pray that the history that we learn, the vision that we see in your word, will help us in our daily lives and with those around us. But also, help us with our faith in you, that we may know that in the past you were so faithful and that you were still faithful today. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. So it was, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven, and I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. Nehemiah 1, verses 4 and 5. Let's read that again. So it was, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven, and I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. To date, two groups of captives have returned to Judah in at least partial fulfilment of God's promises to the Hebrew nation. But there is one more company of exiles that God is preparing. The last group of captives is commissioned to fix a problem. Although the first two groups return to rebuild Jerusalem and to complete part of that project by finishing the temple, the rest of the construction was abandoned as opposition from the surrounding nations arose. The people from the surrounding area didn't want the Israelites to build the city and its walls because they were afraid that the Israelites might become a mighty nation as they had once been, which we read about in Ezra chapter 4 and verses 6 to 24. That reads, In the reign of Asuherus, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. In the days of Artaxerxes, also Bishlam, Mithridath, Tabal, and the rest of their companions wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia, and the letter was written in Aramaic script and translated into the Aramaic language. Rehum, the commander, and Shimshai, the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to King Artaxerxes in this fashion. From Rehum, the commander, Shimshai, the scribe, and the rest of their companions, representatives of the Deniats, the Aphasathites, the Tarpalites, the people of Persia and Erech and Babylon and Shushan, the Dehavites, the Elamites, and the rest of the nation whom the great and noble Osnapper took captive and settled in the cities of Samaria and the remaining beyond the river and so forth. This is a copy of the letter that they sent him. To King Artaxerxes, from your servants, the men of the region beyond the river and so forth. Let it be known to the king that the Jews who came up from you have come to us at Jerusalem and are building the rebellious and evil city and are finishing its walls and repairing the foundations. Let it now be known to the king that if this city is built and the walls completed, they will not pay tax, tribute or custom and the king's treasury will be diminished. Now, because we received support from the palace, it was not proper for us to see the king's dishonour. Therefore, we have sent and informed the king that search may be made in the book of the records of your fathers. And you will find in the book of the records and know that this city is a rebellious city, harmful to kings and provinces, and that they have incited sedition within the city in former times, for which cause this city was destroyed. We inform the king that if this city is rebuilt and its walls are completed, the result will be that you will have no dominion beyond the river. The king sent an answer. To Rehum the commander, to Shimshai the scribe, to the rest of their companions who dwell in Samaria, and to the remainder beyond the river, peace, and so forth. The letter which you sent to us has been clearly read before me. 
And I gave the command, and a search has been made, and it was found that this city in former times has revolted against kings, and rebellion and sedition have been fostered in it. There have also been mighty kings over Jerusalem, who have ruled over all the region beyond the river, and tax, tribute, and custom were paid to them. Now give the command to make these men cease, that this city may not be built until the command is given by me. Take heed now that you do not fail to do this. Why should damage increase to the hurt of the kings? Now, when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum, Shimshai the scribe and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem against the Jews, and by force of arms made them cease. Thus the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, ceased. And it was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Thus the return of the Israelites appeared to be a threat, one that they were determined to stop. But God didn't call his people in order to abandon them in the process of doing what he had called them to do. Thus he was preparing another man to carry out his will and to accomplish his purposes. His name was Nehemiah, and to him and his work for the Lord we turn. Sunday, October 6, Nehemiah receives bad news. The book of Nehemiah opens somewhat in the same way the book of Daniel did, as we read in Daniel 1, verses 1 and 2, and that was with bad news. And Daniel 1, verses 1 and 2 reads, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim king of Judah into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Yes, many had returned to their ancestral homeland, but things weren't going too well for them there. Question, read Nehemiah 1, verses 1 to 4. Why was Nehemiah so distressed? What was his response to the bad news he received? Nehemiah 1, beginning at verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, it came to pass in the month of Chislev, in the twentieth year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. So it was, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept, and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Some Jews, taken captive years earlier, were brought to Shushan, one of the four administrative centres of the Persian Empire, where Nehemiah served in the royal palace as a cupbearer. The term used for Hanani, one of my brothers, most likely refers to a blood brother, because there is a similar but more familial sounding reference to Hanani in Nehemiah 7 verse 2, although it could be a reference to just a fellow Israelite. The conversation with Hanani most likely happened between mid-November and mid-December of 445 BC, some 13 years after Ezra's return to Jerusalem. Hanani reports that the situation in Jerusalem is dire. The people have not been able to rebuild Jerusalem, and the enemy had destroyed the walls of the city, leaving it defenceless and desolate. It bears mention that King Artaxerxes crushed the hope of the returnees by stopping the progress of the construction after the people beyond the river complained, and we read about that yesterday in Ezra chapter 4. 
This allowed the enemies to destroy the walls of the city. As we read in verse 23, now when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum, Shimshai the scribe and their companions. They went up in haste to Jerusalem against the Jews and by force of arms made them cease. Nehemiah would have heard rumours of such disaster, but he didn't have definite answers until this time. Even though the temple was rebuilt, it wasn't fully functioning, because the people needed for the temple service were unable to live in Jerusalem. The situation saddened Nehemiah as the implications of the news penetrated his soul. The Jews had not glorified God even though they had returned for that purpose. Instead, they had neglected the house of God and the holy city because of their fear of the enemy and oppression. Thus, Nehemiah automatically turns to God. He doesn't complain that the people of Judah lack faith or put them down as cowards, nor does he just accept the situation as the status quo. Nehemiah just gets down on his knees and starts praying and fasting. And so to finish the day, at this bad news, Nehemiah wept, fasted and prayed. What should this say to us about how we, especially in times of trial, need to appeal to the Lord? Monday, October 7, Nehemiah's Prayer Question, read Nehemiah's Prayer, found in Nehemiah 1, verses 5 through 11. What are the different components of the prayer? Why does he include himself in the prayer as those who are guilty? Nehemiah 1, beginning at verse 5. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open, that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you, and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest parts of the heavens, yet... I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer. There's an illustration here of a seven-part chiasm, where it starts with 1. God, you are great and have mercy, in verse 5. 2. Hear me, in verse 6. 3. Confession of sins, in verses 6 and 7. 4. Remember your promises, in verses 8 and 9. Going back now, 3, you have redeemed us, in verse 10. 2, hear me, in verse 11. 1, God grant prosperity and mercy, in verse 11. Nehemiah's prayer is a beautiful composition recounting God's greatness, their own sinfulness, and concluding with a cry for help. The prayer resembles the prayer of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, and it is possible that Nehemiah was familiar with that prayer. It is noteworthy that Nehemiah doesn't begin with a cry for help, but rather first states the truth about who God is, great and awesome. He also points out that God keeps his covenant and has mercy on those who love him, as if to remind God 
that he has always been faithful and cannot now be any other way. The prayer is in a special structure depicted above that centres on verse 8 where Nehemiah articulates God's promises. Nehemiah says, Remember. In other words, Remember, God, that you promise that you will scatter us when we are unfaithful, but that you also promise to bring us back and restore everything. Since the first one has happened, now it is time to fulfil the other, because we are returning to you. Nehemiah is not afraid to claim God's promises and to remind God of them. Of course, It is not that God doesn't know or remember his promises. Instead, God takes pleasure in our willingness to claim his promises. He wants us to believe in them and thus speak them out loud to him. By verbalising what God has promised us, we can be strengthened in our own resolve to trust in those promises, especially at times when everything seems hopeless. And to finish the day... What are some of God's promises that you can claim for yourself right now? Why is it important never to give up claiming those promises? After all, if you do give up, what's left? Tuesday, October 8. Nehemiah speaks out. Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 11 says that Nehemiah is the king's cupbearer. To us, this may seem like an unimportant job. But cupbearers could be men of powerful influence, since they had constant and close access to the king. Cupbearers tasted beverages for the king in order to prevent illness or death of the king. Herodotus points out that the Persians held cupbearers in high honour as they were regarded as high officials. For instance, the cupbearer of the Assyrian king Esarhaddon also was the chief minister of the kingdom. Thus, Nehemiah holds a high position in the kingdom and because of his access to the king, he pleads with God to use him in speaking to the king about the situation in Judah. Question Read Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. What happened as a result of Nehemiah's prayers and fasting? Nehemiah 2, beginning at verse 1, And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. Therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad, since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid and said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? Then the king said to me, What do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favour in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, How long will your journey be, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Furthermore, I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river, that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah, and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple, for the city wall, and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. The prayer is answered in the month of Nisan, which is roughly the month of April of 444 BC. Four months have passed since Hanani and the Jews brought the disturbing news about Jerusalem to Nehemiah. For four months Nehemiah prayed and fasted, and every day it might have seemed to him as if God were not answering. 
But God's timing is always perfect. God prepared the king to hear Nehemiah and to respond favourably. It was not an everyday occurrence to have the cupbearer relieved of his duties for a time to be a governor in a different land. God spoke through Nehemiah and impressed the Persian king Artaxerxes I to make Nehemiah a governor over the territory of Judah. The mention of the queen suggests that this was possibly a private occasion, as it was not customary for the queen always to be present for formal banquets. Nehemiah does not immediately mention Jerusalem in order to keep the king from having preconceived ideas, but rather he makes an emotional appeal to the king about something personal to him. By the time the specific place is mentioned, the king has been won. And so to finish today, in what ways can we see a parallel between Nehemiah's position in this court and Daniel's in Babylon? What does it say about Nehemiah's character that the king seems so positively disposed toward him? Wednesday, October 9. Nehemiah sent. The king sent letters with Nehemiah to Sanballat the Horonite and to Tobiah the Ammonite, the high officials of the region beyond the river, in order to pave the way for what Nehemiah was to accomplish. Accordingly, the king commanded Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, to provide Nehemiah with all the timber necessary to rebuild the city walls, and the gates of the temple. Question. Read Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. What do these verses tell us about the opposition Nehemiah and the Jews in general were about to face? Nehemiah 2, beginning at verse 9. Then I went to the governors in the region beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me, when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard of it, they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. Nehemiah arrived in Jerusalem sometime in the second part of the year 444 BC. Opposition appears to spring up even before Nehemiah attempts any action, as the request delivered to the governors stirs up problems. Although Tobiah is a Jewish name, which meant the Lord is good, his son Jehohanan also carried a Jewish name. The Lord is gracious. He served as a governor of Ammon. Thus, Jerusalem was surrounded by enemies. Sanballat, the governor of Samaria to the north, Tobiah, the governor of Ammon to the east, and Geshem, the Arab, to the south who took hold of Edom and Moab. Read more about Gershon the Arab in Nehemiah 2, verses 18 and 19. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, Let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they laughed at us and despised us and said, What is this thing that you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? It is unfortunate that the leadership in that region shunned Nehemiah for being concerned about the well-being of the oppressed. Bullies don't rejoice over the good fortune of those they intimidate. Ellen White writes in Prophets and Kings, page 635, Nehemiah's arrival in Jerusalem, however, with a military escort, showed that he had come on some important mission, excited the jealousy of the heathen tribes living near the city, who had so often indulged their enmity against the Jews by heaping upon them injury and insult. Foremost in this evil work were certain chiefs of these tribes, 
Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arabian. From the first, these leaders watched with critical eyes the movements of Nehemiah and endeavoured by every means in their power to thwart his plans and hinder his work. So to finish today, what other biblical stories can you find that showed how those called by God to do his will faced opposition? Bring your answers to class on Sabbath. Thursday, October 10, Nehemiah prepares for his task. No question, the Lord had called Nehemiah to this task and would provide all that he would need. Armed with the knowledge of God's promises and the certainty of the call by God, Nehemiah proceeded, but he moved ahead carefully and prayerfully. In other words, even though he knew God was with him, This knowledge didn't keep him basically from thinking through what he would do. Question, read Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 11 through 20. What does Nehemiah do to prepare for the project of rebuilding the wall? Nehemiah 2, beginning at verse 11. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me, I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem, nor was there any animal with me except the one on which I rode. And I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent wall and the refuse gate and viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and its gates which were burned with fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but There was no room for the animal under me to pass, so I went up in the night by the valley and viewed the wall. Then I turned back and entered by the valley gate, and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the others who did the work. Then I said to them, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall at Jerusalem, that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, Let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to do this good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they laughed at us and despised us and said, What is this thing that you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? So I answered them and said to them, The God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore we his servants will arise and build. But you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem." Leadership Lessons Lesson 1. Nehemiah does not tell anyone what the plans are that God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem, as we read in verse 12. Not only does he not tell the enemy, but he keeps it from the Jewish leaders as well. He is on a scouting mission to figure out what needs to be done. Lesson 2. Before presenting anything, Nehemiah does his homework and plans out all the work that will be required. Lesson 3. When he does speak of the task, Nehemiah first outlines what God has done so far to lead this expedition, and that he adds the words of the king. He encourages before he asks for commitment. It is nothing short of a miracle that the Jews respond so favourably and decide to build despite the resistance that will come. God had prepared not only the king through Nehemiah's prayers and fasting, but also the Jewish people, so that they respond boldly and courageously. 
Question, read Nehemiah 2, 19 and 20. What do these verses tell us about Nehemiah's faith? How might texts such as Deuteronomy 7, 9, Psalm 23, 1 to 6 and Numbers 23, 19 have helped Nehemiah? Nehemiah 2, beginning at verse 19 again. But when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard of it, They laughed at us and despised us and said, What is this thing that you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? So I answered them and said to them, The God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore we his servants will arise and build. So you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. And then Deuteronomy 7 verse 9. Therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. And Psalm 23 verses 1 through 6. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord, forever. And Numbers 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Our conversations demonstrate who we are and what we truly believe. Nehemiah tends to speak uplifting words. He is not afraid to include God in all that he says and to glorify him as well, even when people jeer and laugh at him. Even though Nehemiah knows the contempt the enemies feel toward them, he doesn't mince words or leave God out of the conversation. Like Joseph in Egypt many years earlier, Nehemiah is not afraid to promote his God among people who do not believe in him. Friday, October 11. Nehemiah was a man of prayer. Nehemiah, Ellen White writes in Prophets and Kings, page 629 to 630, had often poured out his soul in behalf of his people. But now, as he prayed, a holy purpose formed in his mind. He resolved that if he could obtain the consent of the king and the necessary aid in procuring implements and material, he would himself undertake the task of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem and restoring Israel's national strength. And he asked the Lord to grant him favour in the sight of the king, that this plan might be carried out. Prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, he entreated, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Four months Nehemiah waited for a favourable opportunity to present his request to the king. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. One, in answer to Wednesday's question, what does it mean that all through the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, those called by God face tremendous opposition? In fact, what does it mean that in almost every case they did? Perhaps a better question could be, What examples can you find of someone called by God to do his will who didn't face opposition? What does this tell us about how we shouldn't get discouraged when, even while doing God's will, we face strong obstacles in accomplishing what we believe the Lord has called us to do? 2. Read Nehemiah 2, 
18, And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, Let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. What does this tell us about the power that a personal testimony can have? And how was it crucial in getting the positive response that Nehemiah got from his fellow Jews? 3. Neither Ezra nor Nehemiah could have accomplished anything without the help of the king. In other words, these men of God worked in cooperation with the political authorities who were pagans as well. What lesson can we draw from this about when and how we as a church can work with the political powers that be, whatever they are? At the same time, when doing so, why must the church be very careful? 4. Go over Nehemiah's prayer in Nehemiah 1, 1-11 in class. What can you take from it that will help deepen your relationship with God? What does it teach about surrender, confession and claiming promises? Let's read Nehemiah chapter 1 and those first 11 verses. The words of Nehemiah the son of Hakaliah. It came to pass in the month of Chislev in the twentieth year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with me from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. So it was, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open, that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are faithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest parts of the heavens, Yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Gift of 4,000 Euros. It's by Viriato Ferreira. A serious dilemma unexpectedly emerged on a Friday morning. The architect of our Vita Salis Wellness Centre announced that we urgently needed to put up railings around several buildings. If someone falls, you'll be in trouble, he warned. We knew that he was right. Vita Salas, an Ellen White-inspired centre of influence that works in harmony with the ethical, professional and spiritual values upheld by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, is located atop a mountain near the town of Penella, about 115 miles or 185 kilometres north of Portugal's capital, Lisbon. The architect put the cost of the railings at €4,000. That's about US... $4,900. 
I turned to our chief financial officer. Do we have the money? I asked. Absolutely not, he said. There is no money. Worried thoughts filled my mind. Suddenly a conviction struck me. Whose project is this? I thought. It's not mine. It's God's project. I shared this conviction with the chief financial officer and other people present at the meeting. God will supply the means for these railings, I said. Are you comfortable in going ahead and ordering the railings? They nodded their heads in agreement, and I prayed, Lord, we are going to order these railings because they are really needed. We ordered the railings. Five days later, on a Wednesday, I received an email from someone whom I'd never met. Doctor, he wrote, I just want to tell you that I have deposited 4,000 euros into the Vitasellers bank account. Praise the Lord, I exclaimed out loud. I wrote him an email describing the events of the previous Friday morning. He replied immediately, Doctor, this confirms that the money is for this project, he wrote. On Friday morning, I woke up with a desire to help Vitasellers. I have never been there, but I just had that feeling. Still, I wasn't sure whether my wife would agree with me, so I prayed a short prayer. Lord, if this is your will, put the same desire in my wife's heart. As soon as I finished praying, my wife came into my office and said, Honey, you know that project in Penella? I think we should help them. I couldn't believe my ears, and I asked her, How much do you think we should give? I think 4,000 euros would be good, she said. What a lesson for me. Had we stopped our work at Vitasalis because we lacked the funds, we would have lost out on a big blessing brought about by trusting in God. It was not about the railings. It was about God showing us how his work can be fulfilled when we trust in him. Dr. Viriato Ferreira is a director of the Vitasalis Wellness Centre in Penella, in Portugal. This week's lesson has been read by Dr Percy Harold from Queensland, Australia. It is brought to you by Hope Channel, the Sabbath School Department, and through the services of Christian Services for the Blind. A video of this podcast also occurs on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.